The BYU football program gets back to work today as they look to bounce back from their loss against the Kansas Jayhawks and Lawrence on Saturday. What did I take away after a second viewing of the tape for the BYU football program in that loss? We're talking about it on a film review Monday of Locked On Cougars. You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Thank you to all of you who are everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and, more importantly, for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. All right, let's launch right in on today's show. BYU now 3-1 and one on the season and 0-1 oh and one after their first Big 12 contest in a BYU program history. And looking back at the film, let me start off with kind of an overall picture. Uh, I rewatched the game. I was lucky enough to travel out to Lawrence. So I watched the, the majority of it on the plane ride home uh, from Kansas City. And uh, the biggest thing I took away rewatching this game is it was an opportunity lost for BYU. Even though they couldn't run the football for a you-know-what, they just couldn't generate any rushing offense, the passing game was so on point that if BYU had not given away 14 points to, on the uh, scoop and score fumble return right out of the gates in that game, and then obviously the pick six later in the game, BYU very well may have come away with their first ever Big 12 win and their Big 12 opener. Now, that's ifs and buts and we're candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. I, I, I get that analogy. The biggest thing for BYU is it's an opportunity lost in this game because, like I said, even despite an absolutely horrific rushing performance, BYU was right there in this game and giving up 14 points to anybody, really, home, away, uh, FCS opponent, FBS, Power 5 opponent. You're going to be hard-pressed to come back in a game and win it, and BYU found themselves on the wrong side of the margin in the end. Lost by 11, gave away 14 points. Simple as that. Also, the other turnover you had in this game, the other interception, was cashed in for seven points of its own. So 21 points essentially given away by BYU's offense in a 38-point performance by the opponent. You can do the math there. It's disappointing for BYU, but now all you can do is turn your attention uh, to getting ready for Cincinnati and bounce back and getting to one and one in the conference and getting to four and one on the season. That's got to be the whole self-focus for BYU right now. Now, in terms of film review, what I took away from this game, I thought in the second half, we'll start off with the second half uh, first. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but there were some statements made. I was watching the broadcast uh, and I really respect Lewis Riddick. He is a, a very very bright mind when it comes to football as a whole. He does a lot of NFL work, obviously. He's on Monday Night Football and the like, but there's a lot of stuff in studio for ESPN, and now he's calling college football games. He was teamed, with, teamed up with Mark Jones in the booth for this contest. He had two quotes I, he I heard on the broadcast that I, I heard finally after re-watching the game. And by the way, before anybody gets mad at me, uh, a number of you get mad at me when I wear a red shirt. This is a San Francisco 49ers shirt I'm wearing. So just before you get some of the, the, the mean comments I don't want you to wear a red shirt on this on this uh, program anymore. You know what? It's San Francisco 49ers shirt. Move on. All right. Nonetheless, uh, moving along here. Comments from Lewis Riddick. First thing, uh, he said the all the looks thrown at them, uh, put them on their heels. That was what he said midway through the second half after BYU just seemingly was just completely out of their element on defense. And he's absolutely 110% right with that take. I'm just reading this off my phone. I, I wrote it down as I was watching this game and he was dead on with that. BYU's defense in the second half looked completely lost. Their looks that Kansas is throwing at them, bringing different players out, different formations, lining up guys in different roles. It seemed like stuff BYU had not seen on tape and they weren't necessarily ready to respond the right way. Does part of that go to coaching? Yes. Does part of it go to the players needing to figure it out? Obviously adjust. Yes. They just did not match up well in the second half of that game. Kansas came alive in the second half. And the other thing about this, Kansas just got a, a, a mindset of, we are not going to be stopped by these guys. We're going to run it down their throat. And if they can't stop it, so be it. The other quote uh, here, quote, it makes you tentative and guessing when you're getting beat like this, and then you vacate gaps. Dead on. 
Second half, I'm watching defensive linemen trying to make a play, guessing where the pressure is coming from. They vacate a gap and guess where the Kansas running back or in, uh, in many cases, Jalen Daniel goes right in the seam where you were supposed to hold up your gap integrity in this game. It was very evident. Lewis Riddick nailed it on the broadcast. Absolutely nailed it. I could not have identified or stated it better myself when it comes to how things performed in the second half. Now, with regards to that, I felt like BYU's defensive ends as a whole, I'm I'm including all the defensive ends, they did not perform like they performed against Arkansas. Against Arkansas, they were bringing all kinds of pressure. The gap integrity was incredible. They were uh, hemming uh, in uh, the uh, KJ Jefferson coming up the field, but not, ensuring that he was not going to be able to scramble outside of them as much as possible. Jalen Daniels found no such difficulty against BYU. He was able to go where he wanted, when he wanted, as often as he wanted. The defensive ends from BYU, a week after they had maybe one of their finest performances I've seen in some time, had a, 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 a letdown performance, uh, for lack of a better term. It was not good enough from the entirety of, the, of that unit. The defensive tackles, they had their own issues. Atu Naisamahe got uh, moved out of his position way too often. I saw John Nelson, just his lack of overall girth. He's a very, very high-energy player, but he's not 200. He's 280 pounds at best, it feels like. He needs to be 300 pounds to really hold up against the offensive lineman b he's going up against. I thought Jackson Cravens, I wrote this down. Jackson Cravens can move for a big man. He's listed at 305 pounds, I believe, if I, if I recall correctly, looking at BYU's roster. That dude can move. He chased down Jalen Daniels a couple times from behind. That's a very impressive job by a big man in the middle of BYU's defensive line. But the defensive end struggled uh, mightily. The defensive tackles are not absolved in that. It just it wasn't good enough. They got punished time and time and time again. And they wilted under the pressure that Kansas is bringing from that offensive front. So uh, the defensive line's got to buck up here. they got to bow up, as some people say. And they've got to be better this week against Cincinnati. Now, uh, the other funny thing about this, it's ironic, I guess, in a way, but BYU did some drop eight in this game. And I wasn't surprised that they were going to go drop eight because when you have a guy like Jalen Daniels, you want to keep everything in front of you, ideally. The drop eight for BYU in this game, when they did it, was just as bad as it was under Elisa Tuiaki and Ed Lamb's leadership the last two years. Unless you have guys, the three guys rushing the passer that can just uh, beat double teams and get to the quarterback, essentially have an elite pass rush threat with those three guys, it is uh, doomed to fail because you saw Jalen Downs just sit back there and, all right, one, 1,000, two, 1,000, and they got like the seven, eight, 1,000. And he's like, oh, I'm going to fire it in there for a first down. I'm going to scramble out here and make a play. It's, it, it was just as bad. In some ways, it's, a, it's like a sarcastic, ironic, uh, told you so, I, I don't know wasn't good enough from the defense uh, with regards to reining in Jalen Daniels. And that proved to be their undoing. They had a big opportunity. Remember that third and five late in this game it was like four minutes and change to go. They need to get a stop, get the ball back. They're down one possession. They drop eight. Jalen Daniels scrambles out and, uh, Caleb Christensen, among others, did not recognize it in time as Jalen Daniels scrambles to the left. We're able to meet him where they needed to meet him, and he gets the first down. He, need, he needs five, he gets six. And at that point, it was like the backbreaker in, in a way in this game. It was tough to see that. So uh, not good enough from BYU on that front. Uh, one other thing. There's a toughness element uh, that I did not sense uh, was there from BYU, especially along that offensive line. Run blocking's not easy. Pass blocking, you're essentially uh, just kind of holding back and just uh, keeping guys at bay, really, when it comes to pass blocking. It's more passive than run blocking. Run blocking is, a, is in a mindset right now. I look forward to having Connor Pay on the podcast this week, and we're going to ask him about that toughness element. It seemed to be lacking in this game. BYU just could not get enough push out. In the second half, when you're trailing, you're going to start throwing the ball more. So the, the rush element in the second half, uh, you guys can say, well, why aren't they running the football? You got to throw the ball to get back in the game. That's just simple. Uh, that's simple philosophy when it comes to football. In the first half, though, like I said, there was just a toughness element. You saw it on full display from Kansas's offensive line. They have a mindset of toughness. They are going to punish you. They make life miserable for opposing linebackers and defensive linemen. BYU is not doing that right now. I don't know what it's going to take for them to get untracked, but they've got to get untracked as soon as possible. Or unless they want to have to rely on 350 some odd yards passing, 50 plus attempts from Keaton Slovis. If you want to go full Mike Leach and, and throw the ball over the yard and become full air raid, be my guest. But uh, you've seen what the evidence is of a full air raid offense under Mike Leach is sometimes it has great success. Other times it gets completely shut down. And that's the concern. You want to have a running game that comes alive at some point. And I would just hope to high heavens that it happens this week. But 
I, I've been hoping that since the season opener against Sam Houston. So I don't necessarily know what to make. Now, there's some good things as well that I saw in the film after rewatching this game. We'll talk about those and we'll get to those here in just a minute. First, a word on our friends over at LinkedIn. They've been working on this for many, many months now. The best part is they are one of our recruiting sponsors here on the Locked On Podcast Network. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business, my friends. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and more importantly, for free. All you got to do is go set up that job to profile today, then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you are hiring. And more importantly, have simple tools like screening questions, making it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and ultimately hire. And that's why small businesses right now are rating LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus their leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs help you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. And more importantly, you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college right now. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post that job for free terms and conditions apply. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends over at UCCU. Learn and earn. The UCC mobile banking app is paying your entire family to learn about money. Kids look to parents who become financially literate, and parents don't always know the answers. I'm a parent. I'm about to have my third kid. I don't have all the answers. Learn and earn helps break down those financial topics into fun, bite-sized educational games like quizzes and trivia. Every time a family member completes a topic, they earn points that accrue and can be redeemed for gift cards to stores like Amazon, Apple, Sephora, Walmart, Nike, and many Many more, my friends. There's age-appropriate content for every member of the family who can compete against one another and track their progress on leaderboards. Learn and Earn is available inside the UCCU mobile banking app, so play it anytime, anywhere. The more you play, the more you learn, and the more you learn, the more you earn. It's simple as that, my friends. It's all co- courtesy of Learn and Earn, part of UCCU's award-winning Be Money Smart Youth Banking Program, helping kids, teens, and parents all have fun while becoming more financially literate together. It's all courtesy of your friends at UCCU. Love where you bank. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars a part of your day. Thank you for being everydayers with us right here on the podcast. Reminder, coming up this Friday, another edition of Locked On College Football Kickoff Live, Friday morning from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Mountain Time. That's 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. It's available on every YouTube channel that has a Locked On College channel, including Locked On Cougars. Check that out on Friday. All right. The good news uh, for BYU from that film review wasn't all bad because BYU, like I said, they were very much in this game. An 11 point loss uh, does not do this game justice. BYU is right there with Kansas. And Kalani Satake is absolutely right after this game when he was asked, Hey, what did you learn about your team in terms of your first Big 12 class? We can play with these guys. BYU absolutely can play with Kansas. Is Kansas going to be the upper echelon of the Big 12? No, I, I don't think that. They are ranked number 23 in the country after their 4 0 start to the season. It's actually uh, the first time they started 4 0 in back-to-back seasons since like 1915 or something like that. Crazy, a uh, crazy uh, long time since Kansas has started the season 4-0 in back-to-back years, but they did falter down the stretch. They are probably middle table of the Big 12, and BYU can compete with that. Can you compete with that consistently? Well, the depth is going to be a big question this week. I am expecting a pretty long list of injuries, and obviously we're probably not going to get a very uh, clear picture from Kalani Satake when talking about those injuries, but uh, we will endeavor to do our best to keep you updated. It's been very well chronicled how many guys were lost in that game against Kansas, and uh, the vast majority of those guys, it seemed like uh, injuries that were probably – keep them out, at least for this week against Cincinnati. It was good to see Kingsley Suomatii after leaving that game, and he's been dinged up since training camp. It was good to see him return for the final series for BYU on offense. That's a positive sign that he went back out to play in this game after he missed a long stretch in there. All right. Other good things for BYU. The passing game right now is absolutely elite, folks. I don't know what to tell you. And I, I was kind of being sarcastic by saying you want to go full air raid uh, just a minute ago with this BYU offense. This passing game, it's unstoppable. Keaton Slovis is looking like the guy that was the dark horse Heisman Trophy contender going into what was his sophomore season at, U, uh, at USC. He is slinging the rock all over the field. He's delivering it on point, on time. Yeah, every so often there's a misfire, but every quarterback has that. But he is looking very, very confident at the helm of BYU's offense right now. And that's got to give you, a, it's going to give you an opportunity to stay in games with his ability and the caliber of wide receiver BYU has right now. They don't have Cody Epps right now. Uh, he missed that game once again after being a game time decision. He's only played a, uh, just a handful of snaps against Arkansas this year. But Darius Lasseter, Keelan Marion, Keanu Hill, Chase Roberts, uh, Isaac Rex at tight end, they have formed a fantastic, uh, I call it a quintet. I, a quintet. I should say, in the passing game. They're big targets. 
their uh, targets to find themselves open because they're ver- getting better at running their routes. I saw, I thought the route uh, running against Kansas was much better than it was against Arkansas. Are Kansas's defensive backs as good as Arkansas's? That's debatable. But BYU, I, I thought they created nice separation for themselves. And when Keaton Slovis was throwing it as well as he was against Kansas, the wide receiver's job gets pretty easy because he's putting it right on these guys, putting it into the bread basket, as they say. And it's real simple. All you got to do is haul that pass in. So the passing game, very, very impressive. And anybody, by the way, who thinks that Keaton Slovis was the reason for this loss against Kansas, you can stop listening to this podcast right now because I'm just going to tell you, you're dumb. You're dumb. He was so good in this game. Rewatching it, I was even more impressed than I was sitting in that press box watching him sling the rock all over the field. Very impressed with that young man. He shows great leadership out there with his teammates. He, you can tell that he is uh, he is just saying, you know what? If the running game's not going to work. Put it on my arm, and we're going to go out there and do our best. Yes, they did have the fumble and the, also the pick six. I, I, the, the, the call on Parker Kingston, the non-call, I guess I should say, for the targeting, I watched the play again. I've watched it about 50 times at this point. I thought it was just a big hit that dislodged the football. I, I get what's where other people are saying it should have been reviewed. It should be targeting. I think I will acquiesce to saying, hey, they probably should have taken a second look at it. Uh, call timeout, buzz down to the field, tell the officials, hey, let's take a, a second look at this. You know what? Alas, it wasn't that. Also, the pick six. Ball thrown a little bit behind Isaac Rex, but when a guy has a bear hug around Isaac Rex and you barely get one arm up to really tap that football – you know what? It's defensive holding, pass interference. I don't know what, what to say, but it just it was not called on that. If you're gonna, uh, by the way, if you're gonna call the defensive holding call that negated an interception that Camden Garrett had on a fantastic uh, job on his individual defending, you better call some of these like, on some of these BYU wide receivers because uh, they got straight mugged at times in this game. But hey. The, the, the officials are the officials. It, it is what it is. So uh, you have to move on from that. Other things I liked about this game. I thought BYU and pass pro was very, very good. Like I said, there's a mindset to run blocking right now that there's just, it's not there. And uh, I don't know necessarily how to go about fixing it. And I, I don't think Kalani Sitake has an answer for it because he said as much. He said, if I had an answer for you guys, I'd tell you. Well, I don't think he necessarily tells truthfully, but they need to figure something out on that offensive front when it comes to the run blocking. But the pass blocking right now has been very, very solid. I was actually very impressed with Paul Miley's play in this game, especially in pass pro. Paul Miley can get overwhelmed by bigger guys on the interior of these defensive lines. He's not the biggest guy in the world. He lists him at six foot two, 300 pounds. If he's 300 pounds, folks, I'd be stunned. I, I think he's more around 200 and... 75 280 pounds he, he but he battles he is ferocious on the interior he was very good against kansas i thought he might have been his finest performance as byu starting center in that game but like i said it's only one facet of the game the passing game elite the run game absolutely abysmal what's it going to take to get those two a little more balanced i do not know but i really liked what i saw from the pass pro also really liked what i saw uh, in terms of byu's linebacking court now, Ben Bywater, I don't know the status of his injury, and I, I sincerely hope it's not uh, long-term. Some people out there saying it's a torn labrum. Uh, I don't know uh, what's going on with him, and I, I'm sincerely hoping that it's it's not that significant because losing him uh, means losing maybe the key cog on the interior of your linebacking core. Now, A.J. Vong, Pachon, Max Tooley, they're very, very good. I thought Harrison Taggart had his moments in relief of Ben Bywater late in that game. But that linebacking core right now, they are the heart and soul of this BYU defense. They are making every play they possibly can. And at times, they're trying to make too many plays in a way that kind of hurt them against Kansas. But I like what I'm seeing from BYU's linebackers. They're being coached up, and they they know what they're supposed to be doing. Justin N is doing a very, very fine job making sure they know their assignments, and they're attacking the football. The unfortunate part was the entirety of that defense in the second half, like I said, just got a little discombobulated, and they ended up not being on their toes, but more on their heels as a result of just not necessarily, I think, recognizing and adjusting quickly enough to what Kansas was running. So, uh, let me see. Do I have anything else here? Uh, special teams wise, uh, it was unfortunate that Parker Kingston got knocked out of this game. Obviously, Keelan Marion didn't get much of a chance to return kicks. The one uh, kick return he did have, I was questioning why he did it, but he got pretty good yardage out of it. So uh, I, I'm not going to second guess that. Saw very little of Ryan Rico. Uh, obviously, that's both good and bad in certain circumstances, but not a bad thing to have him off the field in a little bit of a shootout like BYU was in in this game. And also, let me just say one thing about uh, what I like about Will Farron and his kicking. That ball 
gets high when Will Ferrin kicks it. It's going to be very low percentages of that kick getting blocked by anybody uh, with Will Ferrin. The way he just, he like it's almost like a sky ball. It just gets up so quick. Uh, there have been a lot of other kickers of late for BYU who don't necessarily have the trajectory. Jake Oldroyd had more of this trajectory. We just got up. It's hard to block kicks that get up from the get-go. And that's what Will Ferrin has with his leg. And it's a very, very positive sign. And the best part about Will Ferrin, uh, we've seen him. He's got good distance with that height as well. So that's a, that's a very positive thing. So there you go. Uh, that's what I've got for you guys. Uh, and also one other thing, Ben Bywater that missed potential interception early on in this game. Ooh, missed opportunity. Rewatching that. He is going to room, not uh, bringing that ball in. He, he prides himself on being a very good uh, receiver, having good hands. And I think he's going to look back at that one and say, Ugh. but Hey, uh, best wishes to him and all the other BYU athletes who are injured uh, in this game. And hopefully they will be cleared, uh, some of them at least, and other guys who may have missed this game against Kansas uh, getting ready for Cincinnati because BYU's depth is going to be tested this week. Absolutely no doubt about it. Uh, but as Kalani Satake says, uh, there's no time to rest. You're going to obviously have a bye week after this to heal some more guys up after this, but you got to go out there and, and really show what you're capable of against the Bearcats on Friday night. So now we will turn our attention to the Bearcats. Obviously looking forward to BYU's press conference coming up at noon today. Kalani Satake as well as about three players uh, typically will speak to the media. And of course, we'll recap whatever we learn of, from that on tomorrow's edition of the podcast. Before we go on today's show, though, we're going to talk a little bit more about other BYU sports. A great weekend uh, for BYU women's volleyball. A really important milestone hit for one of their longtime stars. We'll get to that. We'll also talk BYU cross country, how they performed over the weekend, and also BYU women's soccer back in action today. Big 12 play there in Austin, Texas. We'll talk about all that as we continue on right here on Locked On Cougars. Now, a word on our friends over at Athletic Brewing. Now, Athletic Brewing has been working with us, and they have a new thing each week. They're calling it their Game Changer of the Week, which is brought to you by our friends at Athletic Brewing Company. Much like, and the person I'm going to nominate this week is Ben Bywater. Athletic Brewing has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that taste that actually taste good. And the thing about why I picked Ben Bywater is despite getting injured late in this game, he was making plays all over the field. Had the lone sack for BYU against Kansas, was able to corral Jalen Daniels, which uh, was very, very difficult most of the rest of the game. Had one and a half tackles for loss, B led BYU in tackles with 10 on the night. Ben was uh, clearly on his way to maybe another 100 tackle season or close to it in a BYU uniform this season. Season. Uh, I just want to give him a tip of the cap because it was an absolutely phenomenal performance for him individually against Kansas. Obviously, it would have been very easy to pick Keaton Slovis, and he was kind of a, an idea that I had, but I want to give the tip of the cap uh, to Ben Bywater. But I want to give a couple more words in on our friends over at Athletic Brewing Company. They completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good, have full flavor, and well-crafted, just like a full-strength beer, just without the alcohol, my friends. Their brews are great tasting and award-winning and beat out full-strength beers in global competitions, and they are brewing over 50 styles of craft non-alcoholic beers and uh, non-alcoholic beer excuse excuse me including ipas golden sours and many many more best part is no hangovers ever so give it a shot my friends you can get athletic brewings non-alcoholic brews at a store near you or buy them online at athleticbrewing.com first rising customers can use the promo code locked on to get 15 percent off your first online order that's promo code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n to get on, at checkout for 15 percent off at athleticbrewing.com near beer of course exclusions and conditions apply and athletic brewing company is of course fit for all times Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars a part of your routine. Hope you guys are having a fantastic Monday uh, whenever you hear this. Uh, it was good to see a lot of you BYU fans out there on the road against Kansas. And let me just say thank you once again to those of you who said hi and uh, gave me some well wishes. Uh, to the gentleman uh, who asked Jason Shepard from BYU TV if he was Yawk uh, from the KSL Sports Zone and doing Locked On Cougars. Hey, uh, I don't necessarily think that I, me and Jason look all that alike, but hey, fun all the same. And big thank you to all of you guys. Uh, for saying hi, et cetera, and hope to see more of you out on the road uh, in the near future. All right, before we go on today's show, a couple of notes uh, for the BYU sports over the weekend. BYU's number 10 ranked women's volleyball program uh, swept Baylor, uh, who was ranked number 18. Very impressive showing for BYU women's volleyball in doing just that because yet again, another top 25 opponent, and they just made quick work of them. Great showing uh, for the Cougars in this one. And congratulations to Whitney Bauer. She uh, passed the 4,000 career assist milestone in the Smith Fieldhouse obviously with that win on Saturday afternoon. Congratulations to her. That's a phenomenal uh, deal. Uh, BYU is headed to Austin this coming week uh, for the first big 12 matches on the road. They'll face the number nine ranked 
Texas Longhorns and a pair of matches both Thursday and Friday coming up later this week. And that's where the BYU women's uh, soccer program finds themselves, the sixth ranked Cougars. Uh, we'll see if that changes, obviously, with national rankings coming out today, but they face off against the Texas Longhorns in Austin tonight. Six o'clock Mountain Time start. It'll be on uh, Big 12 now on ESPN Plus if you want to tune into that live stream. Once again, six o'clock Mountain Time. That's seven o'clock uh, their central time in Texas. And also over the weekend, BYU uh, men's cross country ranked number three in the country, missing two of their all Americans ended up finishing second at the Virginia invitational uh, Saturday morning. Number one ranked and defending national champion, Northern Arizona won the meet, but BYU without two of their stars uh, still ended up finishing second. That's a good sign for the Cougars when you lose uh, to the number one ranked team, but uh, you'd hope to have a uh, BYU having uh, their uh, all Americans and Casey Klinger and Davin Thomas and back before too long, but also the women's uh, women's cross country team number six ranked uh, Cougars end up winning the Bill Dellinger Invitational on Friday afternoon. So congratulations to women's cross country. Uh, they finished the race with 42 points in a showdown against uh, number seven ranked Oregon, 78 points. Uh, so BYU showing very very well at that tournament. Alexi Halliday Lowry finishing in fourth place. Aubrey Frethenway fifth, and Jenna Hutchins in eighth. In terms of top 10 ranked uh, runners. Uh, and then Jace Harkins, uh, Farmer 12th, Anastasia Davis 13th, Sadie Sargent 14th, Destiny Everett 15th. Pretty impressive showing for BYU women's volleyball, honestly, in cross country. And they run faster than I can ever dream to run. So uh, congratulations to all of them on that phenomenal showing. All right, that's going to do it for this Monday edition of the podcast. A big thank you to all of you for your support, as always, of this venture. Please continue to subscribe, rate, review the show. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, hit the subscribe button if you have not done so already. Also hit that uh, like button, uh, enable notifications so you always hear, not here, but you'll be uh, given uh, notice when a new episode goes online and is live right away. And also wherever you listen to your podcast, if you're an Apple subscriber uh, who uses on Apple iTunes, I appreciate any and all those five-star reviews you guys can leave us. There are hundreds of you who have already done that, but there are thousands of you who listen to it every day. I'd like to get a few more of you guys uh, giving us a five-star review. And please leave a comment or two in the comment section. Let us know what you like about it. I think you do the same thing or similar format on Spotify, et cetera. So thank you in advance for your support and helping us build the audience that way. The, the algorithms, as they say, really like it when you guys interact with the show. And a big thank you for all of your support, as always. And, of course, Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen today. And thank you to all of you who, once again, are everydayers with us right here on Locked On Cougars. See you.